So before politics, you were involved in e-commerce. You, you founded the, I think, the largest e-commerce company in, in North Macedonia, and also worked as a in business development and e-commerce um, as, a, as a consultant. And I, I'd like to get onto the, the, that question about why you're appointed and what the, the, the rationale for taking someone from outside politics is. Before, though, I'd like to start on um, something which has already been mentioned today, which is about EU accession. Um, clearly, the whole issue of the name of your country has been a problem with Greece in the past. This is now resolved since, since the last time of this conference. Um, what is the situation now with the European Union, with accession? What needs to be done? What would your best guess be? Uh, as you mentioned, and as it was mentioned in the uh, beginning in the talks by Mr. Jörg, uh, we really did a lot to overcome the disagreement that we had with Greece. You know, it took us uh, a lot of courage, a lot of sacrifice. It was a tough decision. We had to change our name. Uh, we are not over it, nor we are happy about it, but this, I think, is a sign of how committed we are to the progress of our country, to overcome this, the issue, and definitely to look ahead to align with the EU values, to join the EU family, to open a 500 million market for our businesses. Mm -hmm. And speaking about a deep commitment, we have also shown it by the structural reforms that we did. Uh, the progress has been also noted and recognized by the Commission itself in terms of the rule of law, in terms of increasing transparency in policy making uh, from the Ministry of Finance side also transparency in uh, uh, financial uh, in terms of the fiscal politics. Uh, we also had a good progress in terms of the fight, the fight with organized crime and corruption, which is very important. And in addition, we, our growth has been put on solid track. So we had 3.6 growth in the first three quarters of uh, 2019. And our projection for 2020 is 3.8%, which is also aligned with the central bank uh, projections. So um, having all this in mind that uh, we did uh, really our hard work, uh, I will try to not directly but indirectly answer your question that we really did our part. You know, the, the decision for the delay of uh, starting the negotiation process was not due to technical factors. So uh, I would say that our commitment, uh, for, uh, we are still staying on the path of the reforms and uh, we, are, we have really done our part. Of course, we are, we are waiting um, to see uh, how the things will go, and uh, hopefully before May there will be a decision of our, with a new enlargement meeting happening in the EU. Um, and those are all great things in terms of the reforms, which were, were, were clearly very beneficial in terms of the growth and, and, and what have you. Um, in addition to that, membership of the EU per se, how does that how does that influence the environment for foreign investors into the country? Um, you know, as a sign for our economic and financial stability is that since that uh, decision for the, uh, the disappointing, let's say, uh, decision was made in uh, October, uh, the, in the confidence of, uh, the degree of confidence of investors and market players has not faltered at all. In fact, this is a sign of, uh, that we have strengthened our economy and that we have financial stability. But of course, on the long run, we are expecting further economic boosts by uh, opening up the negotiation process and getting the date, hopefully. So it's, I mean, it's a, uh, it's, if we compare the countries five years before getting into EU, five years after it, it's clear that it brings benefits to our economy and to the investors' trust. Mm -hmm. But it's good that this was a test and a sign that once we got the disappointing news, uh, the, um, the spreads uh, and yields of the bonds have remained unchanged since July. July. Uh, also, the credit ratings was confirmed, so it's, I think this is a good sign for our economy. Mm -hmm. This is a pitch you're often doing to investors looking to come and do far direct investment in. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of the earlier speakers spoke about the, um, the integrated supply chains and this growth in, in manufacturing offshore and, and, and what have you. Um, I think your economy, I think I read that 48% of your exports go to Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the German economy, as a couple of people have already commented, is in a pretty unhealthy state for, for their terms. How does that, how, how much of a problem is that? What can you do to, to counter that problem? Uh, well, yes, our economy is more than 100% open, uh, but we are a very small country, two million, roughly two million citizens, with a GDP projected of 12 billion for 2020. 
And I think that the best, the most suited economic strategy is actually being open. Mm -hmm. But of course, it brings benefits and it brings uh, risks on the table. And of course, one of the risks that we have, uh, that we had into our minds when we were projecting uh, 2020, in fact, according to the fiscal strategy, 4.2 was the projection of the GDP, and we revised it to 3.8, taking into consideration the possible slowdown of the German economy, which is our key trade partner. As you mentioned, 48% of exports, and in uh, numbers, it's roughly 3 billion go to uh, exports to Germany, and roughly under 1 billion is in imports. So it's, it's evident how significant partner Germany is for our economy. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, I was, as I was uh, hearing also the, uh, the Minister of uh, for Finance for, of uh, Hungary, he was mentioning about uh, the restructuring of their uh, GDP contribution in terms of services. And in addition, I think that why we are uh, in a good, uh, let's say, in a moderate risk level here is because, first of all, we not only growth has been put on solid track, but we have uh, broad-based growth. We, we have uh, growth in agriculture, in construction activity, in investment. Uh, unemployment has been dropping in private consumption. So I think that this shows that we are not dependent on a current uh, sector or industry. So this is one of the things why risk is moderate. Another thing is because of the structural reforms, it's even going downwards. And an additional factor uh, for, the, for the risks and for the space, let's say, for dealing any potential crisis uh, is that our projections uh, for 2020, uh, in terms of, I, I've mentioned the projections in terms of the GDP, but the projections in terms of the budget, we projected 5% increase in the expenditures and 5.6% increase in the revenues, which is compared to this year uh, realization, we had 8.2% increase in revenues and 87 uh, in um, expenditures. So basically there is some leeway for any potential uh, space if needed for, um, for uh, increasing public investment. But of course, uh, this, is, uh, this is all gives a clear picture that we planned it very realistically on a level that is realistic and also gives us some space uh, for maneuver and room. And additionally, of course, our uh, public debt, our guarantee, uh, government debt is 40% which gives us additional space and room for maneuver in case our sharp crisis is, uh, mm. is happening. Um, sorry, so 40% gives you a lot of room, yes, but the, what, what is the current fiscal deficit? Uh, it's 2.3% uh, projected for 2020. Right. For last year, we had projected 25 but the realization was 1.95. Uh, and according to the fiscal strategy, we are also committed to fiscal consolidation of the deficit, and it's projected to 2% for the next two years. So we are committed to, to that, and for, the, for this year we have 2.3%. Uh, so staying within the 3% limit. Yes, limit. It's a, yeah. yes, yes. but as you can see, we didn't even realize the projected 2.5. Mm -hmm. 1.95 was the realization. So. Right. And can I um, finally ask you, just on, on a personal level, and, and well, frankly, it's about the structural reforms as well. So you're coming in from outside politics. E-commerce is something we hear a huge amount about in, in fintech and e-commerce in, in a lot of CE countries. Why, why, why are you here? Why were you brought into the government from that very specific role? What's the strategy? Um, I think uh, putting a digital entrepreneur in the position of uh, finance minister is actually a clear sign it's of uh, sign. our government uh, that is willing to work hand in hand with the private sector on one hand, with the real sector, and on the other hand, to foster digitalization and to foster the digital economy and e-commerce, of course. I think it was more, maybe a, more of a sign of recognition on a personal level and on a professional level. I th you know, I was discussing about the tough decision about the name issue, and I'm often joking that as, since we were changing the name, I would rather call our country Smart or Digital Macedonia in terms in of to show or emphasize the vision, yes, the vision of uh, where I see and our government uh, sees our country uh, in, in the following years. Uh, I think that we are a small and flexible country. We have great potential you know, to change fast, to adopt the technologies. A few role models were mentioned in the opening speech of the director of EBRD, uh, although two of them were left out that I would like to, to stress that are our role models. Maybe in, uh, in terms of the digitalization of the government, Estonia is definitely a country that we are looking up to. Uh, in terms of technology, because we're discussing digitalization and entrepreneurship, Israel is definitely uh, the heartbeat of technology when it comes to they have, I think, around 40% uh, is the tech sector in their GDP. So I 
think that if we infuse technologies in all the sectors and industries where we can, like in agriculture, in healthcare, in education, there is some magical synergy that can happen. So um, not, only, not only that we are committed to these processes, but we strongly believe that we can increase, uh, decrease the gray economy by implementing technologies, uh, in, uh, decrease corruption, of course, and computers cannot make the biased decisions that humans can. Mm -hmm. On another note is the equality and the inclusive growth that can be fostered by technologies. And on the note of e-commerce, e-commerce can, can be really a driver for economic growth. In terms of increasing wages, it's, it's restructuring the markets. And especially for small countries and small economies like ours, it's opening up a new set of uh, opportunities. But of course, in order to, to, uh, to, uh, you know, to uh, apply the technologies and e-commerce and digitalization, we need, first of all, to have the will and then uh, to have the capacities. So I would say that uh, the weakness that I see in this area is our capacities and the digital skills of our nation, which we, we are committed to work on to increase them so that human we really capital. can, the skills. human capital, definitely. That's why our bu uh, budget motto 2020 is called investing, we are investing in human capital because we believe that that's, uh, that's the key factor for growth and progress of any country. Everything depends on people. Mm. And I suppose historically you've, you have had brain drain problems as a huge diaspora of very educated people. Yes, the, the last uh, report by the World Bank actually shows, which is interesting to note, uh, that from the brain drain that we are witnessing, of course, the Balkans is witnessing, uh, there is 32% of the people leaving the country with very low skills and 32 very high skills. So it's the same percentage of very low and very high skills that are leaving the country. But of course, we need to keep uh, to keep our talents uh, in-house and additionally we need to find ways, countries need to find ways. We're living in a new world, in a digital world. We, everything is global now. We need to find ways how to attract people. We need to find ways how to text the digital nomads nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, these whole new concepts ask for new creative solutions. And I think when I'm speaking about creative that we are really, uh, we have potential to develop creative economy which is a that's a, a new concept since five years ago, I think, that it that appeared. And it's very, very um, um, tailored for small countries like ours. Right. Of course, it's combining the digitalization in, the, in, in it as well. Mm. It's a fascinating story. I wish I had more time to ask you about it, but I have a little red light flashing here telling me I can't. Um, I wish you well with it. And thank you thank very, you very much, much. For, for explaining it to us. Thank you. Thank you.